I had wanted to record the politically motivated violence between government and drug cartels. The violence in Jamaica is amongst the most severe of this type in the world. I received an offer to be shown around Jamaica by one of the country's most notorious drug traffickers. And so I flew to Jamaica to make some work with his help and to make a record of the drug production and trafficking trade which occurs there. The trafficker, my host and myself go to see five marijuana fields in the mountains. We walk to them with a couple of local subsistence farmers who live in wooden and tin sheds in a nearby village. They speak to me in the fields and we establish that a big field can be worth $40,000 to the farmer. This is their primary source of income and they're willing to shoot people to protect it. So when, when you sit, so in about a month it's going to be ready? Yes. And then you... Shoot. You cut it and you Can dry it and you sell it. Leave them. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, do you share the money in the village a little bit or not really? No, we just the two of you. Yes, and we, we give a friend them if we have something we can give a friend. Yeah, but yeah. But in this in this village, everybody do the same thing. Everything. So all over the hillside, there's little gardens like this for the weed. You mean the, all the people in the village they grow in some weeds? Somewhere yes, everybody else. is great. All around, yeah, yeah, see yeah. right there, so. The trafficker who's been showing me around has been working in the drug trade for decades. He used to work as the underboss to one of Jamaica's top drug traffickers. When his boss died a couple of years ago, he assumed the top position. Tell me, how, what, how were you in business with Like, what did, what did do? Well, in the first half, he used to plant weed, but after a time after that, no, you know, it's when the government started to mess with everybody, he easily. You know, and he started plant food and citrus. Uh, he used to fill boats with weed and send them. Oh, weed. yeah. That was his work. That was his work. Yeah, yeah man. How, how was that? Was that like a, was that a fishing, on fishing boats that could yeah, go right like, out into uh, the ship? Ship and boat. Uh, Huge ships. ships. Yeah, yeah. And where did they go? Eh? Where did they go to? All boat. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Anywhere where anybody wanted them. He tells me that I work for the US government as I flew in from New York and if I don't I must prove it. My host describes who I am and what I do but it seems to count for nothing. The trafficker asks to listen to the sound recording of the interview so far and after hearing it he finally seems to be convinced. Before we start the interview again however he tells me that if this film gets him in trouble he will kill my host. We continue with the interview and he tells me everything. He tells me about his old boss and how he became part of his boss's operation. He explains that the old boss had been filling aeroplanes with hundreds of kilos of marijuana and sending them to the United States for 30 years. He contributed for many years by accumulating tens of kilos of marijuana in batches from local farmers, like the ones we met today. He points out, however, that he never got rich off it, like his boss did. People change to other things, and people plant their own thing and sell it locally. Right, can't move again. Yeah. So just like that. He's a lucky man, too. He didn't go to jail. Did a lot of the people doing it end up in jail? A lot of big, big man, like big him. People. Really? Top people? End up in American prison. American prisons. Yeah, for they send for them. Like what they send for Dudus. The story of how the drug trade plays into Jamaica's social, political and diplomatic affairs is complex. It's the reason I wanted to come here. For 15 years, I've made sculptures out of paint. These started as crudely cast acrylic forms and slowly became more technically advanced until I was able to construct assemblages held together with fixtures and fittings made out of paint. Wanting to apply geopolitical texture to these works, I had the Chinese army shoot a few sheets of paint for me on a firing range near Shanghai in 2009. The results were compelling. These works then developed into the Taliban bullet hole works, made using moulds cast from Taliban bullet holes at suicide bomb attack sites 
in Kabul in Afghanistan. Now I want to get to the heart of a different story, one that affects not just the people of Jamaica, but the entire Western world. My trafficker has agreed to arrange for a hitman to shoot some sheets of paint for me. He tells me that before he can do so, however, he needs to buy some more bullets from the police. Here we are, we're talking to the Jamaican police about buying bullets because the stockpile is low. We drive the sheets of paint to an adjoining property where we meet two gangsters. Starting early, we depart for Kingston. It's a drive of several hours on bumpy and steep roads. During the journey, the radio news announces a double shooting by the police in a Kingston apartment that morning, which results in two deaths. One of the gangsters from yesterday is sitting behind me in the car. When we stop at a petrol station, my host tells me he's a hitman. I'm unable to work out whether he's in the car for our protection or the traffickers. We arrive in Kingston and to the edge of a notorious neighbourhood called Tivoli Gardens. Tivoli Gardens used to be the territory of Christopher Cope, the Western Hemisphere's most feared gang leader, who was also known as Mr. Crack. Christopher Cope's neighbourhood was the seat of power for the Shower Posse, an international crack distribution gang which has flooded Europe, the United States and Canada with crack for 20 years. They're known as the Shower Posse for their willingness to shower their victims with lead. At the time of filming, Christopher Koch is on trial in a New York City courtroom. When the police and military came to Tivoli Gardens to arrest Christopher Koch in 2010, the neighborhood descended into a state of outright war. 10 days later, 73 people were dead and the military had withdrawn and resorted to using mortars in a desperate attempt to flush him out. My trafficker explains to me that the true figure of dead is around 200, as a shower posse killed anyone in Tivoli Gardens who refused to take up arms to protect Coke. Coke was arrested and the jury is deliberating on his fate as we walk into Tivoli Gardens. My host here is Christopher Coke's brother Kevin, who runs the One Order Gang. Kingston arm of the shower posse. He was Christopher's underboss and has taken over the gangs. He's supremely confident as we walk into his bullet riddled community. Kevin Coke has apparently banned guns, so the gangs continue, but with less violence. We speak to a number of local people about when the police came for Coke. I speak to a local woman whose daughter, this little girl, hasn't spoken for two years since she watched six men executed in her bedroom by the police. One of the men was her father, another one was her brother. She was hiding underneath her bed as it happened. She traumatised. She traumatised from the shooting? Yeah. When the shooting happened, she's scared. And she's not talking. Not talking at all. As well as shooting sheets of paint, I often make moulds of bullet holes, which gives me greater freedom to make the works. So I set about moulding some of the police and army bullet holes in Tivoli Gardens with a fast drying silicon rubber. This system makes a different type of record from the shop works. It's a graphic record of the event that occurred here. After casting the bullet holes, we head back to the car. I ask Kevin Coke if I can interview him, but he declines. On my second last day in Jamaica, I hear that Christopher Coke has been sentenced to two 23-year terms for murder and drug trafficking activities by a Manhattan judge. 
The trial included testimony from Coke's personal torturer, who says he berated Coke for leaving hands and feet all over the torture chamber floor, and occasionally heads as well. Canadian and US police say the shower posse is believed to have killed many hundreds of people in the United States and Canada since the 1980s. As the drug gang took control of the cocaine market, converted it to crack, and held on to control until Christopher Koch's arrest two years ago. Christopher Koch is expected to live the rest of his life in jail in the United States. Many people in Jamaica continue to grow drugs in rural places as they have no other means of survival. Kevin Koch continues to run the One Order gang in Tivoli Gardens, and my drug trafficker has retired from the business and now owns a restaurant.